As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming, I am he, and he will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, Do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There'll be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother. Brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in the winter, because those will be the days of distress, unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything in advance. But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, we'll see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My name's James, and we're going to look at these words together. If you're a guest or visitor, they feel maybe a bit odd and weird, But we've been looking at Mark together, and I hope you see that regardless of who we are, they have something to say to each one of us. 
Now, as a kid, I, I hated coffee with a passion. My mum drank instant cheap black coffee. It smelt horrible. My grandfather drank camp coffee, and as far as I could tell, it looked like motor oil that no one in their right mind uh, would ever want to drink. But over the years, I, I grew to love coffee, particularly the, uh, the brain fog in the morning and the cure, and suddenly the caffeine kicked in, and I was ready and raring for the day. That was until uh, one time when I travelled from Preston to North Wales for a very early meeting in the job I used to have. And I stopped at Costa Coffee and got chatting to the lady, explaining where I was, and that was a bit sleepy. And she slid over the counter this cup of coffee and said, there you go, son, that will sort you out. Uh, I just drank it. Didn't quite process why it might have sorted me out until my heart was beating so much in my chest that I realized when she said it's got five shots of coffee in it that a normal one has only one or two and that literally I felt every corner I was turning someone was going to jump out on me and that I was in the middle of a sort of race. I was wired. Coffee can have that effect, can't it, from being just turning you from sleep into awake through to fully wired. Well, this passage is somewhat of a five-shot coffee as it wakes us up to what's going on in the world. It, it, it may uh, cause us alarm, potentially. But I wonder, as you look at the world, what do you feel about it? As you switch on your news and see wars still raging in Ukraine and Gaza, of now elections and endless debate in UK and now France, of a cost-of-living crisis and struggling to make ends meet, Maybe we're the wired person. Our hearts are beating out of our chest. We're slightly panicky, feeling World War III is just around the corner. Maybe we're slightly sleepy, just head in the sand, kind of just getting on with life. It's just all noise to me. Or somewhere in the middle, kind of an awake, watching it going on. It, it kind of resonates here. Now, as we come to these words of Jesus, we've got to remember that they're teaching us from chapter 8 onwards what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus, someone who denies themselves, takes up their cross, and follows Jesus. And here, Jesus stretches out what it's like to be a disciple from, from his day through to the end of time, a day when Jesus will come back. Now, maybe this morning, we're not a Christian. And this seems a slightly odd and weird passage for you to come into, but I hope you see it makes sense of the world that we live in. It maybe even answers the question about, doesn't your God care about this world? Why is he sat twiddling his thumbs as we think what he's up to in the midst of it? Maybe we're a Christian here today, and this kind of thing really gets us. We're wired into kind of like apocalyptic stuff. We're really keen to think, is, who's this person and this person? What's this political move doing? What's God doing in the midst of Gaza and Israel? Well, we're going to see Jesus just wants us not to worry about the signs, but about holding fast to him till the end. And it may be, just maybe, that quite a few of us are somewhat sleepy. And this is going to wake us up. And as it might feel a little bit too serious to be thinking about on a Sunday morning, particularly Father's Day, I hope it gets you thinking and gets you ready for all that one day will unfold. Because here's the thing Jesus wants to say to us, regardless of whether we're sleepy, wired, or awake. He wants to tell each one of us, stay awake and stay active. Stay awake, stay active. That's a little bit like my wife Sarah, um, as we get 15 minutes into a film, as uh, normally then... <laughs> I suddenly drift off into sleep. She's like, James, come on, stay awake, stay active. What's going on? And Jesus says it to us 10 times in this passage. Just have a look down with me. We'll start at the end. 35 to 37, he says it three times. Therefore, keep watch, be alert. Um, verse 37, keep watch. Verse 33, be on your guard, be alert. He says at the beginning, verse 5, don't be led astray, stay awake. Or verse 7, don't be uh, alarmed. Or verse 11, don't be anxious, stay awake, stay awake, and stay active. He keeps saying to them, be on your guard, you know, like on guard with fencing. Be on your guard, stay active. Verse 9, verse 21, verse 32, and, sorry, verse 23 and verse 33. He really wants them and us to stay awake and stay active. And these words that he says to stay awake and stay active are in answer to what he's been saying in verses 1 to 4. He's told them, this temple, guys, this center of God's worship, the world as you know it, 
it's going to be flattened. And by the time he gets to verse 24 to 27, he's going to say the world's going to end. The sun will be dark and the moon will finish. Here, here is some words about staying active, staying awake in the midst of a temple finishing and the world ending. That sounds like film stuff, doesn't it? Edge of the seat. Why does anyone need to be told to stay active and stay awake? Surely you can't get sleepy over this. What does he mean? Or to stay active, in Jesus' words that we're going to see, is to mean that, um, sorry, to stay awake is is to mean to not kind of um, drift along with how things are going. To kind of give up on wanting to follow Jesus, seeing it's worth him. What's the point when all this stuff happens? To keep on loving him and following him till the end of time, to stay awake. And to stay active, to be on guard... It is to still be making the good news of Jesus known, even in the tough world, we're going to see that it is. Now, on the night that my daughter Alyssa was born, I managed to get 45 minutes sleep. Uh, Ladies, I know Sarah had none, uh, so I cannot complain. But funnily enough, even though we were both tired beyond our understanding, no one, no medical staff said, stay awake, stay alert, stay active, James. No one told us. We knew what was happening. We knew that the pains that were coming would finish. And at one day soon we'd be hold, one moment soon we'd be holding a little precious bundle of life. But look at how Jesus describes these things. He, he says there's signs that he's going to tell us. But also verse 8, look, verse 8. These are the beginning of birth pains. All that he's going to describe, all that we're going to look at, they're just birth pains. Yes, they're painful but they're going to lead to a moment of holding precious life in your hands when Jesus returns. And just like in Alyssa's labor, I didn't need to be told to stay awake. The, the, sorry, the, the NCT classes, the getting ready to have them, what did they teach you? Husbands, wives, this is how you approach labor. This is Jesus' NCT class of helping us not to be so wired that we get lost and caught up in who's doing what and what sign does that mean, nor get so sleepy that we end up just drifting away from Jesus, but staying awake and active, ready to keep following him in all that happens. So let's have a look at the birth pains and see together between now and the end of time, what does Jesus say is going to happen? Here's the first. There's going to be deception, wars, and persecution. Deception, wars, and persecution. Have a look down with me at verse 5. Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I and he, and he'll deceive many. Now, um, here's people trying to lead people away from Jesus. Perhaps they're claiming they're a a Jesus-like figure, someone to be listened to. Uh, Someone that says, yeah, I've I've got things right. Not, Not that Jesus. Whether you want to look back in time and and see people like Muhammad who came and said, yeah, Jesus was a great prophet, but I'm an even better one. Or Joseph Smith of the Mormons who came and said, look, if you you wear my special glasses and look at my special book, you'll see Jesus is nice, but this is better. Or, Or whether Charles Russell of the Jehovah's Witness, or whether Richard Dawkins of the atheist movement yeah, there's you've had this stuff about God making the world, but but here's I know better. Perhaps today, even some bishops and teachers in the Church of England, who say, yeah, I know Jesus said this, but listen to me, this is far better. People who will come along saying, look, I'm the one to listen to. Maybe even some political leaders. You see, the thing is, as we look at, think about this thing of deception, some people want to say, oh, that's a one-off deception. One person who's going to come one time, and he's going to trick people once and for all. But if I told you that the Hills household was organized chaos, I don't just mean that one day of one month you will come along and find that it's organized chaos. I'm telling you what it's like all the time. All the time in the Hills household, it's organized chaos. And Jesus here is giving this sign of deceptions, wars and persecution, not of one-off deception, not of one-off wars, not one-off persecution, but all time. It's a feature of that reality. That's why even today there may be people who are trying to deceive people and lead people away from Jesus. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the one. Might it even be political leaders, leaders of nations might do the same now. And then there's wars, verse 7 to 8, 
When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Nation, verse 8, will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Now, hopefully you don't need convincing of that. You just need to turn on the TV screens, don't you, to see the reality of this? Or even know that in the 20th century, we've become so educated as a society that we've now killed more people in one century than we did in the previous 19. Just because things are hotting up now doesn't mean the end of the world may well come. Every age could have said that wars were raging, famines and earthquakes were happening. And Jesus says these words, look, do you see in the middle, verse 7, don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. They're tragic. But they're not the end of the world. Stay awake. They're going to mark out this time, a broken world. And then there's persecution, verse 9. You must be on your guard. You'll be handed over to local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you'll stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. People are going to be taken before authorities and, and be told off for being a Christian. But it won't stop there. Look at verse 12. Brother will betray brother to death. And the father his child. Children will bail against their parents. It's a persecution not just at the authorities, but even at the level of family. The ultimate place of love, surely, no. Place driven apart by persecution. Again, probably you don't need convincing of this, do you? But as Mark's readers first pick this up, they're in the middle of having Emperor Nero, whose great delight it was, was to take Christians and set them on fire for following Jesus. As we look at stories across the martyrs, across the ages, across the worlds who've died for their faith in Jesus, as we go and visit an organization like Open Doors now that will tell us about Christians in North Korea who are imprisoned and killed for following Jesus, or Christians in China monitored and shut down for going to church and reading the Bible, and even Christians here gathered today who will get a hard time from brother or parent because you're a Christian. You don't need convincing of that, do you? And what does Jesus say? Be on your guard, verse 9. Be on your guard, ready. It's going to come. But equally, look, verse 11. Do not worry. Does he not know what it's like, Jesus? Does he not know how hard it is? Why can we not worry? Well, look, look what comes in verse 11. Why? Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. I promise. Jesus promises his spirit will speak through people as they speak. Why does he want to do that? Well, look what comes in the middle between be on your guard and don't worry. Verse 10, the gospel must first be preached to all nations. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 and 10 says, The only reason today exists is because God longs that people would come to believe in Jesus. It's the only reason you got up this morning is that he longs for more people to hear about Jesus. And it's going to be hard, verse 9, isn't it? Persecuted. But he chooses to you use an eye in our weakness to make him known as his spirit helps us to speak. And verse 13, look, everyone who stands, uh, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. It's not going to last forever, Christian. It's not going to last forever. That's why we need to be on our guard, to, to stay active, to be ready, to keep on speaking about Jesus. As it were, to speed his coming back, as we tell more and more people. That's what the God's Spirit is longing to do as he takes you to work or to home or to communities or to the shops. He longs that you would have opportunities to speak. And sometimes we're asleep when we think it's not my job. It's not skilled, talented, gifted, able. Well, the Holy Spirit longs for you to do that. He's at work in you to do that. We're, we're, we're asleep when we don't speak of the hope we have. Oh, what did he do yesterday on Sunday? Uh, um. Sometimes we think evangelism is about getting people across the threshold into this building. Friends, it's not. This is just the pit stop on a Sunday to rev you up for Monday to Saturday so that we together can make Jesus known. That's why as a church, we, we've been talking about praying for five or however many fingers you've got on one hand because we just want to make it easy that we would pray for five, that we may speak of five because, you know, of your five fingers, three of them, of those three, one of them is willing to talk about Jesus. 
So one and a half of your fingers, someone wants you to talk about Jesus before you've even got there. Will we be on our guard? Will we stay active? Because as well as describing what life's like in these end times, he also speaks of some pretty horrible stuff. And it's this second thing. When God is abused and violated. When God is abused and violated. Now in verse 14, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. We all long to go, yes, please let us understand. What do you mean? That phrase, abomination of desolation, is taken from Daniel. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 11 in the Old Testament. It speaks of a promise of a day of someone coming and standing in God's place of worship doing absolutely horrible things that violate God's law and desecrate his place of worship. It's like he and worship of him is abused. It's so bad. Look what people are to do, verse 14. They're to flee. Flee, don't worry about your coat. We're really sorry pregnant and feeding ladies because it will be hard to run. It's that bad you need to run. Verse 19, it's so bad there's been no day like it in all of creation. And in fact, even some people will be saying off the back of it, verse 22, oh, come follow me. I'm the, I'm the way to get around this. Now, some would have said this happens in AD 70. In AD 70, the Romans come and they do what Jesus promised. They literally crush the temple, take it stone apart by stone and leave it as a building site. And during that process, one of their, their um, governors stands in the temple on the most holy of holy places and does unspeakable and unimaginable abusive and violatory things. God's people see it happen there. But what does he mean, the abomination of desolation? Is that it? Because some people want to say, well, no, there's something even worse coming. Even worse coming one day. Well, just look with me for a moment at verse 30. As Jesus says these words, he says, Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. It may be that some of them are still alive by the time AD 70 happens and they get to see the temple being taken down. But they're actually going to see it in just a chapter's time, aren't they? In chapters 14 to 16, as Jesus, the one who describes himself as God's temple, God's meeting place where people can meet between humanity and God, as what happens to him? He's abused and violated against God's law the person we're supposed to worship we desecrate it makes sense of why his disciples in the garden of Gethsemane are told off for what? falling asleep rather than staying awake as Jesus has just said Jesus is going to be abused in his trial by the religious leaders he's going to be violated and mocked and then crucified on a cross so much so that creation has never seen a day like it because the sun will stop shining. It goes dark in the middle of the day. And people will flee. Do you see what Jesus is saying? This terrible act is going to start in these coming chapters. But just like the Hills household, where we describe something that happens all the time, might it be that this Abomination of desolation is both Jesus' death, it is both a temple being destroyed, but goes on and on today. As we get in the New Testament, Ephesians 6, pictures of Satan trying to tear apart God's church, of trying to take Christians out, of trying to take them down, peel them away and get them to stop believing in Jesus. You only have to look at the unspeakable shame that comes on the Christian faith through the leaders that have been called out. Just these last few weeks, Ravi Zacharias, Mike Pelavachi, just the last few days, Gerald Coates. Leaders that have done unspeakable sin and causing so all traumatic events for Christians alike, causing people to walk away. Or look at our nation, a nation that once was a Christian nation, now walking away from the saviour it once proclaimed. 
As now, statistically, for every one convert, 20 people are leaving the faith. Do we see a society where God is abused and violated? His name just easily mocked because it's easy. Or might it be the promise of antichrist-like figures in kind of Revelation and some of the end of the Bible, these people that are kind of come and lead people astray, whether they're politicians, whether they're leaders, whether they're religious leaders or whoever it might be, might they just be people trying to peel people away, violating and abusing God in the hope that they give up? You get the idea, don't you? In these last days, in these end times, God is going to be abused and violated. It starts at the cross. When God is mocked and scorn poured on him, when the church is dragged through the mud again, when you feel like giving up, what will we do? Well, look at verse 23. Be on your guard. Be active. Why? I've told you everything in advance. Don't panic. I said this would happen. Stay awake. Be ready for these times. Stay active. Or in the words of Ephesians 6, pick up the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and pray in all times. You have the weapons to stay able and active. Don't bury your head in the sand. Don't be shaken. Don't walk away from Jesus thinking, oh, it'll just pass over. No, be active. Remember his promises have already come true. His word is sure, because thirdly, one day these birth pains will be over, and life will come. Here's the third thing, because one day soon, until Jesus' unknown world-ending return. Because although these are the things that are going to happen in these last days, these end times, he said it will come to an end. Look, verse 24, in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Like a picnic rug where we've all finished eating or like a tablecloth where the meal is done. The picture is of God taking the corners and literally scrunching it up into the middle, picking it up, we're done here. Creation done with. As verse 26, the Son of Man comes in clouds with great glory and power. As Jesus comes back. A day where he'll judge the world. But look also, verse 27, where he'll send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven, where he comes and gathers his people, those who have trusted in him, where he protects them and takes them on into his perfect new creation, a heaven made real, an end to all struggle and strife and evil. It may be we doubt him, but look at verse 30 again. You won't pass away until some of these things have happened. They already have. We've already started to see them. So his promise that he's coming back is sure and certain. As he then beats the death after he's crucified to show us there really is life after death. But when will that be? Verse 29, look, even so when you see these things happening, you know that it's near, right at the door. It could be this afternoon. It could be this afternoon. In fact, verse 32, Jesus hasn't got a clue. Only the Father knows. It's his job to decide. We don't know when, but it could be very, very soon. So what are we to do? Well, let's read from verse 35, because he wants to tell us three times, keep watch. Keep watch. Verse 37, what I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Don't be sleepy. Don't just bury your head down and think it will pass all over because you could find yourself having been drifted along. We know that sometimes, don't we, parents, where we we, we watch something that if we had our children or grandchildren next to us, we, we wouldn't let them watch, whether it's graphic violence or sexual nature or just coarse words or whatever it is. We wouldn't let them watch, but we find ourselves being strangely drawn into it and somehow sort of almost going along with it as it's okay. The risk of being a sleepy Christian is that we watch the world going on. We just get drawn into it. Like, oh, goodness, is this all going to end? And is Jesus really good? Does he really care about me? And we find ourselves being going along with the current of the world and drifting away from him. Jesus doesn't want us to be wired and so keen like, is Putin this figure? Is Iran them? Is that this? 
that we become so obsessed by trying to figure out like an escape room or Sherlock Holmes-like puzzle that we miss the point that he's coming soon. Instead, he wants us to be awake. Awake to the realities that could cause us to give up on him. Awake, longing to see the day when Jesus returns. And active, longing to make Jesus known. That's why we're here. That's why his spirit longs us to speak. I don't know whether it's helpful, but at the end of the book of Revelation, the last few words of the Bible, they say these three words, four words, come, Lord Jesus, come. You get to the end of Revelation and see all that's going to unfold, all the, all the hard times, but the joy of heaven is to come. The Revelation says, come, Lord Jesus, come. Might it be as you, as you look at the news, as you, you watch the world, as, as we see yet war raging on, we just say, come, Lord Jesus, come. As we hear yet another person suffering with cancer, might we just say, come, Lord Jesus, come. As we hear of another person struggling, might we say, come, Lord Jesus, come. As we hear of another leader getting it wrong, come, Lord Jesus, come. As we see his church dragged through the mud, as we see Christians vilified and violated, might we say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Knowing that one day he will. Because it will keep us awake. It will keep us active. You see, you and I don't need coffee, although thank you so much to the guys that are going to serve us coffee at the end. We do love having coffee. But we don't need five shots of coffee to get us awake to what Jesus is going to do. We just need to hear his words, realize the reality that we see before us. If you're not a Christian here today, do you, do you see how Jesus makes sense of the world we live in? And how he offers hope that one day it will be an end? Because then we might keep awake. Brothers and sisters, we might keep active. And we might just keep smiling through the challenge of life now, with the tears that it brings, knowing that one day soon, it will come to an end and we'll hold precious life in our hands. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that Jesus knows the end from the beginning. Thank you that one day he will soon return. And as we look at the world around us, with all the deception and wars and persecution going on, all the brokenness, all the violation and abuse of you and your son, we pray, Lord Jesus, come. Help us to be awake and active. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.